Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hi guys, how's it going? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Thanks for being here at CAFE tonight. It's wonderful to see you, as always, and we just so appreciate your support. I will never stop saying that because it's always true. Um, we do have some information about our next couple of cafes coming up. Um, our November CAFE is going to be about moose ecology and the observation of changes in the North Woods by author and uh, Professor John um, Pastor, who's up at University of Minnesota Duluth, and he'll be coming down to share his observations. Um, he wrote a wonderful book called What a Clever Moose Eats, and currently that is also the title of his talk, um, but he's gonna be talking about a lot more than just moose, so please join us for that, third Tuesday of November. And then in December, our very own Don Luce, who is our curator of exhibits at the Bell Museum, is going to come in, I've invited him to come in and tell us about the history of dioramas as many of you know, we are moving our uh, museum to a new location, which is being built right now at the corner of Cleveland and Larpenter on the St. Paul campus. And so come December 31st, we will be turning the lights out at the Bell Museum, as you know it. And then we're going to be closed for about a year and a half. Um, and then September, or not September, hopefully summer of 2018, um, we'll be opening in the new location. And during that closure, a lot of the building is already being built. Um, and you can go check the site out right now. But during that closure, we'll be moving a large number of our historic dioramas, um, which also contain invaluable pieces of artwork by the diorama painter Francis Lee Jaques, along with some other wonderful diorama painters, um, specimens that are as much as 100 years old. And uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of logistical tricks that are involved in this process. So. Um, and why would we even want to go through it? <laughs> so Don's going to come in and talk about why these dioramas are so, uh, so precious and some of the really crazy adventures that we're anticipating having in moving them from one place to another. All right, I want to introduce our speakers tonight. We have two speakers. Um, first, we have da Dr. Catherine E. Bushley. She's an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Plant Biology. And Dr. Bushley's research focuses on various aspects of fungal evolutionary biology and genetics. Her main research interests are the evolution of secondary metabolites in fungi, particularly non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. Yeah? I'm really wishing I had read this ahead of time now. <laughs> and polyketide synthetases in a group of fungi that parasitize insects. She has sequenced the genome of a particular mushroom <laughs> producer, which happens to produce the immunosuppressant drug um, cyclosporin, and characterized the gene cluster producing this metabolite. Other research interests include utilizing next generation sequencing technologies to address what features allow fungi to parasitize and interact with insects to uncover ecological niches that insect pathogenic fungi occupy while not infecting a host, and to investigate the effects of mating biology and dispersal on spatial and population genetic structure. <laughs> That's what I get for being like, oh, I'll just print this off and read it on stage. <laughs> All right, our second speaker is Kat Sweeney, and I, uh, I met her this summer because in the summers I occasionally teach summer camps at the Bell Museum for, for kiddos, um, and we had a fourth, and six, fourth through sixth grade camp, um, and I think we were doing the sustainability uh, camp, yeah? And Kat came in to work with our kids planting oyster, mushroom, oyster mushrooms, um, so we planted oyster mushrooms in like a straw medium, and it was very cool. Those are edible, of course. Um, but also talked a little bit about applications of, of mushrooms to possible biofuels in the future. So that was a tie-in to sustainability. And I just thought Kat did an amazing job with the kids. And so that very day, I was like, when can we get you in for cat in cafe? So <laughs> here she is. She was born and raised in Germany and moved to Minnesota in 1998. She's Associate of Science in Registered Nursing um, in the state of Minnesota and worked as a registered nurse in Minnesota from 2002 to 2008. She has her BS from University of Minnesota in Biology, 
her MS from Oregon State University Plant Pathology with a focus on mycology. She is a lecturer in biology and botany um, at Framingham State University in Massachusetts and then returned to Minnesota just about a year ago to be in her PhD project in the Department of Plant Pathology. She focuses on wood decaying fungi, so she's gonna be talking about that tonight. In her lab, she's worked with lichens and unique lichen compounds, several fungal pathogens of forest trees, <laughs> the identification of fleshy mushrooms, microscopy of fungal tissues, and she loves outreach and teaching, has volunteered her time with the Bell, as I just mentioned, Wolfridge Environmental Learning Center, um, the Unity Center with Roseville Area Schools, and the Mycology Society of Minnesota. She also enjoys hiking, canoeing in the Boundary Waters, gardening, and cooking. All right, thank you so much. Please welcome our speakers to the stage. How's everybody doing? All right, cool. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm Kat, and I'm going to get us started tonight. Um, I'm going to give a general overview of the fungi, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I actually do in the lab, and then I'll let Catherine take over from there. So yeah, the fungi around us. Let's see. Um, mushrooms and fungi, and as you'll notice, I tend to use the term interchangeably, um, are actually a really unique group of organisms. Um, they are grouped in their own kingdom. So biologists recognize six kingdoms. And I have a little uh, picture here. So we have the archaeans or archaea bacteria, the true bacteria, eubacteria, protist, plants, animal, and fungi. So again, fungi have very unique characteristics and therefore they're grouped within their own kingdom um, by biologists. So here's the same idea, I just uh, put a different picture to together. So on top here, you can see our six kingdom system again. And um, what's added in this picture here is that um, we can see some relatedness between all these organisms. And this relatedness was determined by researchers after doing some molecular analyses, um, extracting DNA from different organisms, comparing these to one another. And it was actually found out that fungi are more closely related to animals than they are related to plants. And, and that's pretty funny if you think about it. I, I think it was until about the 60s, 1960s, that fungi were grouped within the study of botany, right? So people believed that, okay, mycology is just a subtopic of, of botany, but as we know now, um, the fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are related to plants. To give you an idea what's, what's actually included in the kingdom fungi, um, we recognize uh, uh, five sub subcategories, if you will, or, or uh, yeah, five subcategories. And to give you an idea what is known within these categories, um, take a look at, at this table here. So there's a group called the chytridiomycota, the chytrids, on top here. And so far, we know around 1,000 species there. And, and these are uh, fungi that are usually associated with aquatic systems. The next up, we have a group that's called the zygomycota. Also, around 1,000 species are known here. Um, if you are interested in fungi, you may know that this group is currently in, in flux, meaning that taxonomy is, is a bit open at this time and biologists are trying to reorganize the specimens within this group. So around 1,000 known species within um, the zygomycota. Then we have the glomeromycota. Again, around 1,000 species are known of these, and these include the fungi that are associated with plants. So many of these live in close association with plants. Then at the bottom here, we have two large groups. The Ascomycota was around 65,000 known species, and the Basidiomycota was 30,000 known species. And I guess people tend to know these things a little bit better. Um, so those fleshy fungi you see in the forest are included there. Many of those pathogens that you may know, fungal pathogens, are included in there. And so they make up the largest portion 
of the fungi that are known and described today. So this, this uh, British researcher Harksworth in the 90s actually has released an, an estimate of, of what is believed to be the biodiversity of fungi that's out there. And that estimate came out to be around 1.5 million species, right? So now if you look at what's known and described so far, you realize, well, this is a really understudied group of organisms, right? We probably only know 5% of the fungi that are out there. So really not a whole lot, right? So yeah, um, biologists tend to focus on other things, I, I, I guess you could, you could say, not so much on the fungi, so an understudied group of organisms. So this was in the 90s, right? But if you look at actually some current numbers, um, the, the estimate, a more current estimate for the fungal biodiversity that's out there is believed to be around 5 million species. So if you put that in perspective, right, uh, as mycologists, we really don't know anything yet, it seems like. So there is a lot left to be discovered. And also, if you feel like in your lifetime you'd like to describe a new species, you may want to give mycology a try, right, and, 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 and check it out. You might be able to describe something new. All right. So taking a, just a quick look at the fossil record of fungi, I guess you can say there isn't a very big fossil record for the fungi. But from what is there, um, it has been extrapolated that in evolutionary time, fungi go back to around 460 million years. So they originated around 460 million years ago. That's interesting because looking at plants and the plant fossil record, it was determined that plants go back around 470 million years ago. So a couple uh, hundred million years in between there and evolutionary time that, that really isn't all that much. And that really made researchers start to look in a connection here, you know? So a connection between the first origin of plants and fungi in evolutionary time. And if you, if you, um, if you think about it, so initially all, all organismal life on the planet was suspended in the water, right? All um, old organisms were aquatic. And um, so somehow, the plants and the fungi must have evolved together in order to get up onto dry land. And so the, the scientists today believe that plants and fungi may have done that in close association, namely in the symbiosis. So a symbiosis meaning a close living arrangement between two or more uh, organisms, two or more parties, that often happen um, to live in mutualism, so both partners or all partners benefiting each other. So that's the, the, the current idea here, that fungi and plants actually conquered dry land together symbiotically. And what those, those old plants could have looked like, um, I put a picture up here of a liverwort um, to give you an idea that the early plants really were just something low to the ground, and perhaps it was something like this that was in a close association with a fungus. Um, when it first made it on dry land. Okay, so the fungal body. What makes fungi so unique? Why do they have their own kingdom? Why are they so different from anything else? If you remember sitting in biology class, right, you may remember, okay, a teacher will talk about an animal cell. It's kind of a blob-shaped, roundish thing. You may think about a plant cell is kind of a square shaped thing, you know. But then you look at the fungal cell, which is called a hypha, plural hyphae, and you see that it's nothing like that in the image on the left here. So here is an example of fungal hyphae, right? So it really is just an elongated tube with a whole lot of cytoplasm in it and organelles that swim around in it, right? So this is our fungal cell. One fungal cell, it's a hypha. Um, in the picture on the middle here, um, this is something that you might see in your backyard as you, as you look around on a leaf litter, what you could see in the, in the forest floor. So you have aggregates or clusters of hyphae, right? And together, a cluster of hyphae, 
make some mycelium. Actually, if anybody in the room here plays Scrabble, um, get your notepad out. These are some really high scoring words. So I, <laughs> they, they go all the fungal, uh, the terms for morphology scores pretty high. So uh, just, just a heads up. Okay, so, um, and then depending on what fungal species we're looking at, species we're looking at, um, sometimes you get these dense clusters of hyphae, so something uh, like this, right? So kind of a mycelial mat, a hyphal mat that you, that you often see. So that's essentially the fungal body. Okay, so for the, for the most part of the year, the fungus, the mushroom, or the fungus rather, I should say, will exist in this form, right? In just kind of a, a mycelial mat, right? But when the environmental conditions are right, um, the mycelium will actually produce what we know as a mushroom, right? Which is essentially the, the fruiting body that is produced with the intent to have a structure that will make spores for reproduction. So when you see the mushroom, it's just really an extension of the mycelium that is there for most of the year. And usually, as you walk around outside, you don't really pay attention to a mycelium, right? You, it, sometimes it's really hard to see. It's covered up with leaf litter or what have you, right? But once the mushroom is there, you actually know that there is actually something going on, that you have this transient structure there. You know, you walk in the forest one weekend and you have a mushroom. Next weekend, it might be already gone, the mush, right? So these are very transient, don't stay very long. But these are the reproductive structure of the fungus, the spore-producing entity that doesn't stick around for very long. Okay, so if you think about how does a fungus survive? How does it get its food? Um, what does it do to make a living? We can uh, generalize and say that they're uh, three types um, of fungal lifestyles, okay? So fungi, like I mentioned before, can live in, in, in symbiosis. Um, symbiosis, so a close living arrangement. And, and that often tends to be a, a type of mutualism where both, or I should say all partners, could be more than two, in that symbiosis will benefit, right? So with the fungi, it, it will often be a situation where the fungus shares the food with the organism that it lives with symbiotically. Then next up, we have the saprophytic lifestyle. Fungi can be uh, sapro, so they can be sap live saprophytically, which means that they essentially grow in their food. They grow in a substrate that they can decompose or degrade, and via degradation, they can actually extract their food, their nutrients out of the degraded matter. Then finally, we have fungi that get their nutrients through parasitism, right? So fungi that parasitize um, other fungi, that parasitize animals or plants or what have you. And um, I'm going to give you a few examples up next of what these three types of fungal lifestyle might look like. So a type of mutualistic symbiosis between a fungus and a plant it's called a mycorrhizae. That's 65 points. <laughs> um, so if you, if you take a look at the picture here of, of the pine seedling up here, you can see that on the, on the sapling's roots, you have some hyphal clusters there. So mycorrhizae refers to the fungi that colonize the roots, um, the root system of a plant, okay? In fact, and, and this, is, this is crazy when you think about it, it, it is estimated that about 90% of all vascular plants live in symbiosis with fungi. 90%, that's nuts, right? So that's, that's a ton, that's a ton. So really, really important, um, really important for the ecosystem. So if we take this apart, right, and we look at the, the two partners, so fungus and plant in the symbiosis, who's doing what? Um, you can say that the fungus in, in, in this uh, relationship, also called the mycobiont, is actually helping the plant to take up extra nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and also helps it to get some extra water. Um, 
the, the plant or the plant partner, also called photobion, photo as in photosynthesis, right, provides the glucose or the sugars to the mushroom. So again, the plant gives the, the fungus sugars and the fungus gives the plants uh, additional access to nutrients and additional water resources. So everyone's happy. It's, it's, it's a good deal. Um, I found these close-up pictures here from uh, a paper I, I came across, and I thought this was helpful in just kind of getting another look at this situation. So in this picture here, you can see this is a plant root. Here you see the root tip, right? And normally you have on the roots these little uh, root hairs, little structures that help the plant to absorb water. And nutrients, in this example, actually, the, the scientist was looking at phos phosphate uptake by roots. So if you follow the dotted line here, okay, you can see that the root by itself, even with its little extension, the root hairs, it can only reach so far, right? And it can only get the nutrients that are really close, close to it, where it grows. And we actually call this the depletion zone, right? So this area... Um, is where the plant gets its nutrients from. Now, if you compare this to a situation where a root is colonized with a microlical fun fungus, and you can see that in my picture here in yellow, you can see that through the, the mycorrhizal associate, the plant is actually able to reach beyond the depletion zone and to get more nutrients out of the soil, right? So definitely um, a big, big plus for plant growth, for plant development, to have these mycorrhizal partners. Um, what this brought to mind for me was this cool plant. Um, related species, when I lived out in Oregon, I've actually seen those out there. Um, this orchid is called Corellorhiza maculata, and um, it, it belongs to a group of plants that are considered to be the achlorophyllous plants, meaning that they do not have any chlorophyll and therefore barely undergo photosynthesis, right? So how does this plant get any nutrients? So you can say that it pretty much entirely it depends on its, its uh, mycorrhizal associate. So this is really cool. So this plant has actually figured out to survive pretty much without photosynthesis, just with the help of uh, mycorrhizal associate. So a pretty, pretty cool situation. Let's take a look at a different um, fungal lifestyle. Parasitism. So there are many, many fungal uh, parasites out there that will cause plant diseases. In this example, I've, I've chosen uh, a fungal parasite that causes a disease in pine trees called white pine blister rust. Remember how you know you're dealing with a white pine? You get bundles with five needles, right, if you want to identify pines, you count the needles. So this is the one with five needles on it. And um, as the disease progresses, it can actually, or I should start maybe at the beginning, let's do that, um, the fungal spores will enter through the needles, okay, you know there's little openings in the needles, the stomates and the fungus can enter through there, get in the needle, and then grow and pro proliferate and grow into the twigs of the tree, the branches down into the stem. As you can imagine, sometimes it takes uh, a few years to develop, so when you see these orange spore masses from the fungal infection breaking through the bark, chances are three to five years post-infection have already taken place. So by the time you see these spore ma masses break through the, the bark of the tree, chances are that tree's toast, right? Um, but, but so this, uh, uh, this tree disease has been an issue for over 100 years, and it, it's still around. We're able to manage it a little bit better, but so it's around, it's due to an invasive pathogen. So that's blister rust. Um, <laughs> this is a, a cool pathogen, if, if you can say that, a cool pathogen. I guess I can. Um, it's, a, it's a corn smut. The disease is called corn smut by a fungus, caused by a fungus named Astelagomatis. Okay, and as this fungus infects the corn, you can see that the kernels take this crazy, 
mutated shape, right? So this blob here, eventually, you know, um, it will rupture and release fungal spores. But at one point, this was actually a normal looking kernel, right? So the fungal infection will cause this kernel to take this, this really weird shape. And then you can see as you cut this open that there are black spore masses that are developing in there, right? And so eventually this, this um, mutated kernel will rupture and release the spores. But one, another thing that I, I meant to say was that um, some people actually collect these mutated kernels and eat it, and apparently it tastes really good. Has anybody here ever tried that? How do you pronounce this? Vitlacoche, <laughs> okay. I hear it's good when you fold it in an omelet, is that right? Mexican cuisine, yes. So I've never eaten it, but it's definitely on my list. I want to try it. Do you eat it a lot? Okay, cool. Yeah, very good. So you guys, give that a try. So this plant disease has the greatest name of all. It's the stinking smut. Um, <laughs> also called the common bunt. You know, the, the plant pathologists, they're, they're really, I don't know, they're, they're pretty creative, I guess. Um, uh, I, I have not been around this ever, so I don't know uh, how bad it smells. Um, I'm, I'm reading on Wikipedia that there is a Germanic origin of the word smut, um, but I also have a Germanic origin, and I have no idea what they're re re referring to. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can't help you there. Anyhow, this is the stinking smut. It's a fungus that's closely related to the one I showed you in the slides before, the corn smut. Um, so this one infects uh, a different plant. This one infects wheat, okay? Um, and you can see, if you take a close-up look at the kernels here, that you don't see the, uh, um, the, the dense inside um, that you usually see in a kernel, but you also see these black spore masses there. And actually, I'm, I'm told that when there is an infected wheat field and at the end of summer the wheat gets harvested, that oftentimes you see these large black clouds um, around the tractor, which are actually the spore masses that come out as, as the wheat is harvested. So yeah, it, it, looks, it looks pretty crazy. So end of summer, um, next year, keep an eye open for the stinking smut. <laughs> so here's another fungal parasite, and, and this one um, in, infects uh, animals, particularly amphibians. And this has gotten some press, perhaps some of you have heard about this before. Let me see if I can pronounce it. Betrachokit Trium dendrobotitis. Um, this one causes amphibian decline. So it has actually put a few uh, frog species on the endangered species list in North America, but this is something that has been uh, around the globe. So this is killing amphibians everywhere. So if you look at, a, uh, at the close up here at the histology slide, you can see here the spore masses that. Um, tend to grow in, in the outer layers of the skin in amphibians, in, in the frogs here in, in this example. And by proliferating in the outer layer of the skin, um, it will actually impair gas exchange in, in these animals, and then ultimately they're, they're going to die as they are not able um, to, to oxygen, oxygenate sufficiently. So this is a, a big problem for amphibians worldwide. Then another uh, fungal parasite um, that is fairly new, I shouldn't say uh, uh, newly described, but newly recognized within the last 10 years or so. This one is called Pseudogymnoascus destructans. Perhaps you've heard about this before by the disease that it causes in bats, white nose syndrome. Um, also, this fungus was recently renamed. Formerly, it was Geomyces destructans. Um, so this is a cause of white nose syndrome in bats. So bats, when they hibernate, they get infected with this fungal parasite, and it tends to grow in the, in the nasal cavity of bats, in the, in the oral cavities, and it actually, uh, uh, it's, it's a quick, 
it's a quick killer for, for these animals. It's, um, it's a bit unique for the fungi in, in that it likes the colder temperatures, so those that you could find in a place where bats would hang out to hibernate in a cave, right? So 5 to 14 degrees Celsius. Um, it, it has been shown that there's animal-to-animal -animal transmission of this pathogen, which of course is a problem. And then it has, it has also been shown that um, certain debris that accumulates in a cave or, or also bat feces, that, that, uh, that is a source of inoculum and, and that that can spread the disease. So again, that's a big problem. In North America, it has put um, a, a few species of bats on the endangered species list, so a big problem. Um, I guess one thing um, I can do is, I guess, public service announcement. I don't know how many of you guys go actively caving. Um, but, but, but so I guess one thing people can do is try to stay out of caves if you know that bats are hibernating in there. Um, if you take gear into a cave, be sure to really thoroughly clean that when you're done. Or better yet, don't transport it from one cave to another cave. Yeah, so... White nose syndrome, a big, big problems with bats in North America. Interestingly, this pathogen exists all over Europe. It has been isolated from the, the nasal cavity, respiratory cavity in bats in Europe. It does not kill European bats. It's a killer for North American animals, or North American bats, I should say. So there is some research that focuses on that. Um, these days, so hopefully we can get a little bit better in understanding here soon. One more parasite. Um, the group of fungi in the genus uh, Melisesia, well known by veterinarians, so they cause a lot of issues on, on pets, skin issues on dogs, cats. Um, sometimes you can see that also on goats and sheep, so vets see, that, uh, see this one a lot around here. So. There's all kinds of other fungal diseases on humans, but I don't have the time to go through all of these, so that, that will be another cafe. <laughs> okay, so lastly, the third group of, of fungal lifestyles okay, would be fungi acting as, as decomposers. Okay, so think about it. Fungus grows on dead organic matter and is able to degrade that, is able to decompose that, right? Um, so if you think about it, these, the, the fungal decomposers are actually a way to clean up, they have a way to clean up the ecosystem, right? Think about a tree falls in the forest, fungus goes on top of it, degrades it, feeds itself, and in the process, frees up nutrients out of that complex woody structure that are then made available for the rest of the ecosystem. So fungi can decompose organic matter. And I put a little diagram here, and perhaps it's difficult to make out the details. Let me give you the takeaway point here. If we start with a green arrow, green as in photosynthesis, right? You can see that photosynthesis in plants takes in atmospheric carbon dioxide, makes glucose, right? Makes from glucose, we get more uh, complex organic compounds, okay? As these organic compounds um, eventually die then and are degraded by fungi, the fungi will break down these compounds uh, eventually all the way down back to CO2 and return the CO2 back to the atmosphere. So you can see that fungi and their decomposer activity, their degrading activity are really important for the ecosystem and proper ecosystem functioning. So fungi can degrade all kinds of dead organic matter, whether that's dung, whether it's fruit, apples, right, bread, um, animal cadavers, whether it's wood, or the dead cells under your toenails. Fungi can go and make a living out of that. So um, yeah, it's amazing. So how do fungi do that? And, and this is how I'm going to start telling you about the stuff that, that I, I do for a living these days. So I, I study the fungi that can degrade and decompose wood, right? 
And um, this is essentially based on a unique feature of fungi in, in that they secrete enzymes, particularly at the hyphal tip. So what's an enzyme? I guess a simple explanation would be, think about a molecule that's made by the fungus that, that can degrade uh, complex structures, okay? So enzymes are basically the chemicals that help to degrade more complex structures. So these enzymes are made in the fungus, right? And usually fungi have uh, large suites of enzymes, so many, many different kinds, different groups. Um, Okay, and they secrete these enzymes into, in, into their environment, right? Um, and these enzymes will then degrade the environment and free up nutrients, smaller molecules, smaller particles, that can then be absorbed by the fungus. So when I teach this to my undergrads, I would usually say, well, think about this as having a stomach on the outside or something like that, right? So. Where, where we have our stomach juices on the inside digest there, well, a, a, a fungus will release these into the environment, right? And essentially break down uh, the environment that it lives in or on um, and then absorb the nutrients that are freed. Um, this is also called sometimes a heterotrophic type of nutrition or absorptive nutrition, okay? And, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to show you um, the next slide here, which is a little bit more of an application of what I, what I do in lab. So I, I'm, I'm working closely with some ideas from the DOE, the Department of Energy, um, with people there who have thought out these, uh, these conversion plants that are depicted here. A few of these are in use, but not a whole lot at, these, at this time. And the idea was, to use uh, woody biomass, so you know uh, timber. Uh, you can you can use um, leftover wood pieces. You you can lose use stumps or whatever whatever woody biomass you come around. You could even use switchgrass, or you could use corn stover, the leftover corn plant after you harvest the corn. You could use all of these as an input to basically generate biofuel, or specifically in this case bioethanol. Um, from the, that woody biomass that we can then use for downstream applications. So the, the plan here from the Department of Energy was that up here we, we bring our woody biomass, right? We bring it into the plant. And step one, actually labeled step two here, so after the input, step two, we would need a, a pretreatment that requires this really nasty acid input, right? So you would have to put uh, uh, sulfuric acid in there and the pH would go down to 1.5 and then you would heat it at super high temperatures for a while. As you can imagine, you have all this chemical, you have all that heat, so you need to build a facility that um, can withstand all that and, and that is, is pretty, pretty expensive. After this takes place, we move into the next, essentially the next pretreatment of our woody biomass, which is called conditioning, requires a ton more chemicals, requires heating again. And the idea is that these first two pretreatments can break down the large molecules in the woody biomass into smaller pieces that enzymes then can act on and actually through enzymatic activity, free the glucose, the sugars, that is stored away in the woody biomass, okay? And that is also called our saccharification step. So once you break down the big chunks into smaller chunks, then get them even smaller, you'll throw some enzymes in there and finally get the glucose out, right? And once the glucose comes out, we go to step four, um, where essentially we, we ferment these sugars, the glucose, and then get ethanol, right? So this is what the DOE has proposed as a more sustainable way to make ethanol, right? Now, um, the people in my lab have actually figured out that there is a better way to do this. And so uh, researchers I work with, with have proposed this idea that all these pretreatments that are really costly, that are, that are kind of toxic, kind of harsh, um, would be replaced by fungi. 
Because essentially, that is what decomposer fungi do. They break down complex woody biomass, right? Break it down in the, in the smaller chunks and then free the sugars, right? Fungi do it to feed themselves. They want to get the glucose to feed themselves. But what if we employed those fungi in, in this idea from the DOE to make um, ethanol in more sustainable ways. So this is the idea on what we currently work on, okay? And so, um, yeah, so all these steps could be replaced with fungal activity. And so the, the fungus, the wood decomposer specifically that I work with is called Postia placenta. It actually, it's funny, it has become such a, a, a lab workhorse fungus. A lot of people use it in labs, but you don't see it a whole lot in nature anymore. And, um, you know, this is what it would look like. So it's, it's pretty nondescript, kind of crusty looking. So, you know, nothing exciting like a, a fun uh, purple mushroom that you've seen earlier. But anyway, so this is Postia. It, 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 uh, it is grouped in with a group of fungi called the brown rut fungi. They're called brown rotters as they degrade woody biomass. They leave this uh, a brown woody residue behind. Um, one unique characteristic with, characteristic with these guys also is that they induce rapid strength loss in wood. So you really don't want this on building materials, right? Uh, if you have this on your deck or your porch, so things would pretty rapidly collapse after the fungus gets in there. But because it causes this rapid strength loss in wood, it has become attractive to scientists as they are trying to understand, well, how come it's acting so quickly? How come it can modify wood so efficiently, right? And, and so from, from that perspective, it's a really attractive uh, fungus to work with in lab. So now this is what I see every day. It's not that exciting, really, I guess. Um, but so here's my pure culture. I grow my little postia, um, a nutrient agar, throw a piece of a popsicle stick in there um, just to keep it happy, you know, because it likes to degrade stuff. Um, this is how I make sure I grow the fungus and nothing but the fungus, right? So I look at it and make sure it's a pure culture. Then I'll take the pure culture or pieces of it and put it in a mason jar. Mason jars are so good, even in the lab, seriously. It's good stuff. You put some soil at the bottom. Just um, The fungus doesn't grow on the soil. It's just there as a moisture cushion, okay? Put the fungus on top, and then I place these aspen wafers in there, and by propping them diagonally, I'm forcing the fungus to grow up in just one direction, up the wafer. Um, looks really simple. Um, Surprisingly, it takes a long time to do. So what is it that I'm actually after here? What am I trying to do? So this fungus, Postia, has been around for a while, right? And, ha and has been studied well. And we even know what enzymes it makes to degrade wood, right? So there are a couple hundred enzymes, and those have actually been well described. Still, we don't know enough to make use of it efficiently in that DOE uh, application pitch, right, for, for the uh, production of bioethanol. So my focus now is when and where are these enzymes secreted by the fungus that are actually enabling the wood degradation process? So you could call it, if you wanted to sound fancy, um, spatial temporal resolution. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, and so like I said, in, in these mason jars, I grow um, the fungus up one direction, okay, and then I make a couple cuts. And you can see that here in this mycelium, make a, uh, I actually, I got too busy, I actually only know make two cuts, no more than three cuts. And um, things that I pay attention to is the top of the hyphae, where we find the younger mycelium, remember it grows up, so youngest mycelium on top, oldest mycelium or oldest hyphae at the bottom. So I pay attention to where I harvest my tissues from. And so why am I doing that? Why is that interesting? Because we have found out that different enzymes are released at different times and in different places in the mycelium. Guess it makes sense, right? If you think about the human body, you just don't produce, your body doesn't produce the same type of molecule in a brain 
in your brain that it would produce in your foot, right? So it makes sense that different parts of the body produce different molecules. So we, we're paying attention to that, and it's nice, this is a nice system. We know a lot about it already. I even know um, the structure, the DNA basis of the enzyme, or I should say the gene, the part of the fungal genome that encodes um, that enzyme. I even know what that looks like. So I, I, got the, I got the letter code for those genes. And because I have that information, I can make a probe that will selectively bind to the expression of that gene in the hyphae that grows on here. Does that make sense? <laughs> kind of? Read me that. Okay. So I know what enzymes I'm looking for, right? I know what they're called. I even know what the gene region in the fungal genome looks like, you know, the genetic code, right? So you got the basis, you got the code. I know that, that is in the literature. Anybody can read about that, okay? But what we don't know is when and where would we find these enzymes, right? When and where, so my spatial temporal resolution, would I find them more in the younger mycelia or would I find them in the older mycelia? Does that help? Yeah, yeah? okay, cool. Um, so I made these fluorescent probes, okay? Um, think about it perhaps as a, a magnet that has a, a, bright, a bright color attached to it, and this magnet is designed to only attach to this gene region of interest. Gene region of interest that makes that enzyme of interest, right? So I slapped this all together in lab, and it actually found my little magnet, my little tag here. I found out that it works. So in yellow here, I, I stained the hyphae yellow. Um, and in red, you can see my enzymatic, or I should say my gene region of interest, right? So I know that the gene is activated right there at that part in the mycelium. So it's good, good to know, system works. Now I just have to apply it. So let's move it up a notch. So now here we got a cross section of a, a piece of wood that had been infected or had been inoculated with my fungus, with my postia, right? Uh, in green, oops, think about the grain of the wood. So essentially green, the grain of the wood. In yellow, you can see the fungal hyphae. So again, I stained all these with certain colors. And you can see that the fungal hyphae grows pretty much parallel to the grain of the wood. So then I slapped my tags, my little magnets, with a red dye on here again. And now I already get a little bit better resolution. In this piece of wood, I can see, actually, I have that marked, I think, yeah. I can find my, my little magnets here. It's hard to see it on there, in three locations. So I, I have advanced, I, I, I like to think. I have already advanced, the probe works. Um, it binds to the gene region of interest. What I have to do next is I, I need to, to quantify it. So how much of the signal do I get? And can I make a statement from um, reliable data, so data that I can reproduce, right, and that can I actually publish and tell to the public, that makes me, oh, that enables me to say enzyme A is only secreted up here when the mycelia is 48 hours old, enzyme B is only secreted here when the mycelium is three weeks old, right? So I want to know when and where these enzymes are released and with the staining, this fluorescent staining technique, I think I, I have um, a methodology that's going to help me to do that. So again, why is this important? Because we want to know when in what part of the process to add a particular fungal enzyme, right? So remember, we have several pretreatments here that we want to replace with the fungus, and then eventually we have this, this step that acts on the smaller molecules that were generated, right? So I, I want to figure out when to add which fungal enzyme in the process here. And so I'm just getting started on it. It will probably 
take me a couple more years to figure it out, and perhaps in the process I might get a PhD. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we, we'll see. Um, <laughs> so this is all I have for now. I thought I'm going to let Catherine go next, and then if you have questions, take those at the end. Thank you. Okay, so I'm um, Dr. Katherine Bushley. I'm a new professor at the University of Minnesota. I actually came from Oregon State University also, so also love Oregon. Um, and I, I hope I didn't, she didn't scare you away with those long technical introduction to me. <laughs> I, th I think I could have said it in a one-liner. I study invertebrate pathogenic fungi. <laughs> and tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit more about insect pathogens. They're probably some of the coolest fungi out there. They belong to, they're not mushrooms. Everybody, that's, that's, that's exciting. Everybody thinks, or what, what do you think of when you hear the word fungus? First thing that comes to your mind. A mushroom, of course. <laughs> so I do not study mushrooms. I study um, things that are called ascomycetes that Kat talked about. Um, that are ascomycetes are the molds that you see in your bathroom, those little gray things in the shower. Um, and they pretty much grow as hyphae, although they do also have a sexual stage. And these really cool structures are the sexual stage of an insect pathogen. So they're essentially the mushroom, these, these spines, orange spines coming out of the insect. And they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. This is uh, one called Cordyceps militaris. And this is the, the famous fungus that, that um, she couldn't pronounce uh, earlier, <laughs> uh, known as Telepocladium inflatum. There you go. <laughs> Um, and its, it's fruiting body is up here, and, and all of the spores are produced in these structures. So these sexual, like just like a mushroom has lots of spores, these fruiting bodies also produce a lot of spores. Um, I thought I would actually just start with a, a video. Um, I, how many people have seen this video from the BBC? One? Only one? Two? Okay. Well, then that's three. Three, four. Okay. This is a really classic video on... It's, it, it starts with a fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. There's another one for you. <laughs> um, and it's a pathogen of ants in tropical rainforests, also known as the zombie fungus. How many people have heard of the zombie fungus? Okay, more people have heard of the zombie fungus. Good. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and play this. It's a really nice in introduction to the insect pathogens. Okay, so, so, so you can see how beautiful and amazing these fungi are. How many people are sold on the cordyceps? <laughs> Yay, okay. Um, so here's a few... Um, additional species, um, this is a Cordyceps militaris that I showed you before, which is a bright, fleshy-shaped um, fruit body. Um, this is actually a fungus that I collected in China. Um, it's also an Ophiocordyceps. I think that's a pretty good Scrabble word, too. What do you think? <laughs> Nutans. But this is parasitizing a scarab beetle. And these two long structures here are the fruit body. Um, and here's Telepocladium inflatum. Um, it's actually coming out of a log. So these little white blobs here are the fruiting body. And if you took a knife and you kind of like gouged in and dug, dug down into the log, you might find a poor dead beetle down there. Probably you would find a poor dead beetle down there. Um, but you'll notice that these structures are really kind of optimized to spread spores and to infect new insects. And that's, in fact, really the, their purpose, is to get up there high in the canopy or get out where they can release their spores and infect new insects. Um, as Kat was talking about, um, these, so these are ascomycete fungi. 
and they also have uh, the the insect pathogens belong to a group of fungi that have different hosts and different lifestyles. So there are actually some at the base of this group that are plant pathogens or plant symbionts. They're the vegetarians of the group. Um, and then there are some shown in blue here that are parasites of other fungi or they're mycophagus. And finally down here, we have a shift to what are the true, the true meat eaters, um, the insect and insect and also invertebrate pathogens. So things like nematodes, rotifers, and many different insect species. Um, so you might ask, what good are insect fungi? They're really cool. They live in the tropical forest. Um, why, why should we care about them? So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about their, their use as in medicine, as traditional and in, mo and in modern Western medicine. So why French pharmacists need to have training in mycology. <laughs> um, we talk about the immunosuppressant drug cyclosporin and also the cordyceps fungus from China, um, also called the caterpillar fungus, which has a lot of potential health benefits. And the second use of insect pathogens is potentially as control, um, biocontrol of insect pests. So Sir David Attenborough talked about how um, in the tropical forest, these fungi can sort of control insect populations from going out of control. Um, we can also exploit that and use some of these fungi to try to control insect populations that have gone out of control <laughs> um, as, as a practical application. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the, the Chinese caterpillar fungus, um, also known as, well, it's now Ophiocordyceps sinensis. Um, I actually spent about a year in China um, studying this fungus and some other insect pathogens. Um, they, I'll tell you in a minute that they are very specific pathogens of a moth species. And they're also very valuable. So this is a collector from uh, Yunnan province, China. And here he's cleaning, he's collected all of these specimens. This is probably about, I would say it's like close to when it gets to, finally gets to market, it's close to a thousand dollars worth of fungus here, <laughs> um, and he's cleaning them here, and then he's going to sell them to a middleman who's going to sell them to a fancy shop in Beijing, or is going to export them here to the United States. Um, and Ophiocordyceps subsinensis has been used traditionally in Chinese medicine for over three hundred years, so it has a long history of medicinal use in China and also Tibetan medicine. Um, it's recently been discovered by the Western alternative medicine market. Um, you may have seen some of these in the Seward Co-op, no less. <laughs> There's our volunteer. Um, and it is an incredibly valuable fungus. It, it Probably by weight, people have said that it's, it's equal to gold by weight. So it, it brings in huge revenues in China, um, a total harvest of upwards of 100 tons and U.S. $225 million in just the Tibetan Autonomous Region. So that's a very valuable fungus. Um, it also has a lot of really beneficial health benefits. Um, it was first, uh, well, it was first discovered by us, the Western world, <laughs> in um, 1993 when some Chinese athletes um, participated in, in 1993 games. And I think about three or four of their women long distance runners beat the world record by 15 to 30 seconds, which is huge in the world of running. And so everybody wanted to know what, what, how, what was the, how were they training? And it turns out they were actually eating um, this cordyceps, a, a broth of this cordyceps mushroom every day, also training at high altitude. That probably helped too. Um, but that's sort of when the interest in this fungus in the Western world arose right around 1993. Um, it's also known as Himalayan Viagra. <laughs> it uh, stimulates male sexual ability, <laughs> we could say. Um, 
it also has immune stimulating properties. It's there are some polysaccharide components that um, may actually have anti-tumor and antiviral activity. Um, so actually be really useful in treatment of cancers. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and antioxidant, and it also has been shown to lower blood sugar. So some people would say it, it's kind of the panacea, a panacea fungus. Um, and it's been used in traditional Chinese medicine to treat lung, kidney, and liver disorders primarily. Um, a little about its ecology. So it is a very rare fungus, and now it's actually endangered. Um, it's so rare that it's endangered. And it grows only above 3,000 meters on the Tibetan plateau. So this is its habitat. This is a this is actually not a yak, believe it or not. <laughs> it's something called a zo, which is a cross between a yak and a water buffalo, I think. I learned something. <laughs> Um, but these are just alpine grasslands, and here are some, these, this is a picture that was taken by some of my Chinese collaborators of um, local people. The, most of the harvesting is actually done by local villagers in chi throughout China, um, and here's people on a pretty steep slope just bending down. These are very small fungi. They grow out of the grass, and they're trying to find them all along this slope. Um, this is the moth that it parasitized. It's a what's called a hapiolid moth, and there's 57 different species that it can parasitize. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. And this is its life cycle. And so this is where you'll learn a little bit more about insect parasitism um, that I study in my lab. And in Chinese, it's called dongcheng xiao chao, which means or translates to winter worm, summer grass. And that actually very accurately uh, reflects its lifestyle. Um, in the winter, so this is, an, it's a burrowing insect. It, the larvae um, live underground and they actually eat plant roots. Um, and so in the late autumn, here's a, a cordyceps fruit body producing all of those spores. And those, if those happen to land on a poor little larvae here, it will become infected. And over the winter, it, it's living in the soil. And like the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis uh, zombie fungus, it does actually cause a behavioral change. So um, the larvae during winter actually orients itself um, with its head pointed up and a certain distance from the soil surface. How it knows how to do that, I have no idea. <laughs> um, but the reason, the fungus is very likely manipulating that behavior. Um, because what happens, it overwinters like that. And in early spring, um, the fungus will sprout out of its head and start growing straight upwards, bursting through the soil and producing its uh, fruiting body that will release more spores. So here's the fruiting. This is in summer, it'll grow and then release more spores and infect more larvae. So winter worm, summer grass. And they do really look a lot like little blades. They're very difficult to find, actually, as I discovered when I went to the field in China. <laughs> They're just very small little blade, little brown structures in an, in an, in an alpine gra grass. Um, and so it does also have um, both a sexual and an asexual cycle. And that's something that's very common for actually most fungi. Um, and in fact, mycologists have been laughed at by the rest of biologists for having two different names for fungi. Um, we oftentimes name the asexual cycle something different from the sexual cycle. Um, now we're getting rid of that. We, we, but, but for a long time, we often had two names for the asexual and the sexual fungus. So the sexual fungus is in fact this fruit body that's coming out of the insect. So it only this fungus only mates or only has sex inside of an insect. That's the only time it can actually mate and produce this fruit body that produces sexual spores and then can infect more moths. Um, but it also um, can grow as hyphae. So these are, these are the hyphae that Kat showed you. And 
Um, you know, it can grow on a petri plate. It's very slow growing, I have to say. It takes about a month to grow on a petri plate. Um, and those will produce asexual spores and can also just propagate themselves. Um, interestingly, the so if you go to if you go to um, the Seward Co-op, for example, <laughs> what you probably will find in the supplement department is actually the mycelial form of this fungus. So there, there's they isolated the mycelial form from one of these spores and grew it in a petri plate. And now most of the supplements in the US are actually produced from the mycelial form. And there, those have been tested, but there is some debate about whether the caterpillar form might actually be more potent, might have more activity than the mycelia. So that's an interesting fact that not very many people know. <laughs> um, but there is a real problem with just continuing to harvest this fungus in the wild um, because it is highly endangered. And because it's worth so much money, um, people over harvest it. Um, it's really actually pretty much the source of income for many rural people in China. So they spend their summers collecting uh, this fungus and hope to survive on that for the rest of the year. Um, and unfortunately, um, so this is a mature, this is actually a diagram from another researcher, uh, Daniel Winkler, who's also done a lot of research on this fungus. And this is sort of diagramming the development of the fruit bodies. So here is a young fruit body just coming out of the soil. Here it's growing a little bit bigger. And here it's finally mature and it has a lot of spores on the tip. And this is a mature stroma, and it can release up to 40,000 of these spores every day. So it's just spewing spores into the environment. And remember that these are the spores that will actually infect new insects in the soil. And so if we pick the fungus before it reaches this stage, we're actually sort of potentially decreasing infections and decreasing the production of new infected larvae. Um, and unfortunately, um, people prefer to pick the fungus before it reaches this stage. And so that's actually a real problem. And these are more valuable, they're worth more money, and in the end, economics has won. <laughs> um, and so it is in fact now endangered. It's only found on the edges of the Tibetan plateau, so on the rim in China, in northern India, uh, Nepal, Nepal and Bhutan. Um, and I, when I was in China, I actually worked on some of its population biology, so trying to understand the genetic diversity across this whole range or the southern range. And it turns out that this is a hot spot for the diversity of the fungus in this southern region of China. But I think it is going to be very important that, that they try to preserve some of this natural fungus in the environment because it is a very unique resource and it's a very valuable resource. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna completely shift gears. <laughs> well, not completely. Um, so I've been talking a, a little bit about medicinal uses of some of these fungi. And now I'm gonna go a little, get a little bit more technical and talk about secondary compounds of insect pathogenic fungi. Um, I'll start with something that hopefully most people are familiar with, penicillin. How many people are familiar with penicillin? Okay, good. <laughs> penicillin was the first um, antibiotic to be discovered, um, and it was in fact from a fungus, a penicillium fungus. And this is also a decomposer. Here it's growing on an orange, and these are the, these are the spores that it's producing. And here's the compound penicillin. Um, penicillin is a class is produced by these this fancy enzyme, non-ribosomal peptide synthetase. Uh, we can call it an NRPS if that is easier. <laughs> Let's just call it an NRPS. Um, and these are one class of fungal metabolites. And the reason that they're interesting is that they don't. They produce peptides, 
Um, so how many people know what a peptide is? A few people. So, so a peptide, a protein is a peptide, and it's made of individual units called amino acids. Um, these NRPSs produce peptides or strings of amino acids, but they don't do it the usual way, like most proteins. Um, they actually produce a protein that is called the NRPS, and then this protein is producing all of these small peptides just by putting together the amino acids themselves. Um, so pe things like penicillin, um, I'm going to talk about cyclosporin, um, which is also produced by a non-ribosomal peptide synthetase, NRPS. Um, and then there are also compounds like ergotamine, which is, um, it's an ergot alkaloid. Um, it was thought to potentially be involved in causing the Salem witch trials way back in 17th, 18th century. Um, cyclosporin, and this is also just to illustrate that we really don't know very much about the metabolites that fungi produce. And that if fungi in our backyard may actually have some use. Um, cyclosporin is a cyclic peptide. So if we broke this down, there would actually be 11 amino acids composing it in a circle. So it's cyclic. And it is a very important immunosuppressant drug. Um, it's pretty much everybody who has an organ transplant gets to take cyclosporin. Um, it prevents rejection of organs, um, and it just keeps the immune system under control. Um, it was isolated from a fungus that was collected from a soil sample in a national park in Norway. There was an employee from, of Sandoz Pharmaceuticals who went on vacation in Norway, and he went to this beautiful national park and took a little bag of soil brought it back to the lab, and they isolated fungi from it, and then started testing these fungi for their activity, and their, their against medical activity. Um, this is the fungus, and Tilopocladium inflatum. Why don't we all say that? Tilopocladium inflatum, okay. <laughs> it's kind of beautiful. And it's actually, named, so the inflatum part is actually based on the spores, so this is the asexual fungus here, and if you notice, the spores are in the end here, and this structure has sort of an inflated base, it's kind of pear-shaped, so it's like, like that, and the spores on the tip. And so the name inflatum comes from that particular structure. So this is the asexual form, so these are hyphae, these are hyphal, forms and they grow everywhere in soil. So that's, this was what was isolated from that soil sample. Here it is infecting a beetle. Um, I think I showed you this earlier. Here's the fruiting body with the spores on top. Um, sadly, this is what remains of the beetle right here. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's barely recognizable and it's grown out of that. And if this were Oftentimes it does uh, in infect insects in wood. So if this were embedded in wood, all you would actually see are these two little white fluffs on the top here. And it's grown out so that it can actually disperse its spores um, through the forest. Um, so this drug was, it was, they basically sort of grew up the fungus, extracted chemicals from it, and then tested them for all kinds of activities and really found that this, some compound from this fungus had a very strong immunosuppressant function. Um, they identified it, identified its structure, and it really did revolutionize organ transplantation in medicine. So this is the first kidney transplant, um, I think back in 1954 maybe. Um, but up until cyclosporin came around, this was really a, a risky procedure. Um, you know, you got a new kidney, there was maybe a 50% chance that you would reject it. Um, with the, the use of cyclosporin starting in the early 1980s, um, it became a much more routine and, I mean, it's still not a, it's still a little worrisome to have a kidney transplant, but um, most people survive. Most people 
keep their organs and, and can live a productive life. Um, because of its immune properties, it's also used to treat autoimmune disorders. So things like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, um, things like that. Um, this is its life cycle. This is a little complicated. I, that's one thing you'll learn if you study fungi. You'll have to memorize all kinds of crazy life cycles. <laughs> and this is, this is one of them. Um, so here's, again, is the sexual state, producing sexual spores. Those, can inf those actually have to uh, drill their way through an insect cuticle, so the outer covering of an insect. They have to get inside. And here is shown a hyphae that's actually like penetrating right through the outside cuticle, right here. Um, and that's sort of like the infection stage. So you've got to, in order to be a pathogen of an insect, you have to get inside. <laughs> um, once you're inside, though, your, your strategy is to grow really rapidly and try to kill your insect, <laughs> basically. And interestingly, inside of an insect, um, this fungus no longer grows as hyphae. It um, turns into what are called blastospores. So if you see these little round blobs here, those are blastospores. Um, and this is essentially like a yeast. So these will bud in half. They'll split in half and make more blastospores and more blastospores and more blastospores. And those can travel through blood, through insect blood, really rapidly and sort of get everywhere in an insect. And Interestingly, many human pathogens also do this. So um, once they get inside their host, they become this yeast phase and then just travel everywhere through, through their host. Um, so likely, this fungus also produces some compounds that eventually kill the insect. And here's a poor larvae that got infected and mummified on the right with the fungus, and, the, and now the fungus is growing out of it. And, but these are actually asexual, so that it hasn't actually produced the sexual form. Um, and we now know that cyclosporin probably does serve a function of actually suppressing the um, insect immune system. So we know in humans that it attacks a particular molecule and stops the production of these immune compounds called interleukins. In insects, um, this is a control, and this is uh, insect treated with cyclosporin. And this is the insect immune response. It produces some compounds that are antibacterial peptides and also some called lysozymes. And you'll see that in the cyclosporin treated insect, it, it produces a lot less of them. So this is a normal insect, and this is one treated with cyclosporin. So it's, it's also inhibiting the immune response of an insect. And that's probably its, its real function in the world, is to uh, cause the insect to die or to in inhibit its immune response. Um, so I'm gonna actually gonna show another short video. This is, this is one of my favorite videos. It's really, really funny. <laughs> and um, this is sort of a segue into the use of these um, fungi as for biocontrol agents. Um, but it's also gonna talk about this process of insect pathogenesis and the role of metabolites in that process. And it's a fungus called Bovaria bassiana. And it's, it's a very good pathogen of a wide range of insects. And it has, there's actually a commercial product um, that's a biocontrol agent. They're spores. It's like a powder. You can mix it up in water and spray it on your tomato plants and hopefully prevent them from being eaten by insects or infected by fungi. Um, so it does, have, it does have some promising uses. Um, so here we go. It's just really funny. <laughs> Mealybug is an important insect pest of cassava in Thailand. Adult mealybugs can lay 100 to 500 eggs in egg sacs, which develop into the first nymphal stage within 8 days. The nymphs molt 3 times, so the insect has a life cycle of 21 days. The mealybugs are transferred from plant to plant by ants or wind. The insects dwell under the leaves and suck plant sap. Mealybugs spread in dry and warm conditions. 
They are able to damage Kasava fields in a short period of time. As an alternative to chemical insecticides, entomopathogenic fungi, including Boveria bassania, can be used as a natural means of insect control by using topical application of fungal spores. Boveria spores land on the mealybugs. With high humidity, spores germinate and penetrate the insect cuticle. The early infection cells, called hyphal bodies or blastospores, are formed inside. So those are the yeast, that's the yeast phase right there, hyphal bodies. <laughs> inside the insect body, the innate immune system is ready to defend against the invading pathogens. Insect hemocytes would be a major line of defense. On the fungal side, secondary metabolites play crucial roles in insect pathogenesis, such as avoiding the insect immune response or as toxins for killing insects. Our previous phylogeny identified two polyketide synthase genes highly conserved for entomopathogenic fungi, including so PKS3 and PKS2B. <laughs> we are also studying the roles of a non-ribosomal peptide synthase gene, FER-S, in insect pathogenesis. PKS3 consists of ketosynthase, acetyltransferase, and acyl carrier protein, the three principal domains. PKS2B is similar to PKS3, except it does not contain the anoyl reductase domain. The non-ribosomal peptide synthetase, FER-S, is arranged in a modular structure. Each module consists of adenylation, thiolation, and condensation domains. We studied the function of the three genes by disrupting each gene with a selectable marker. When the selectable marker interrupts the <laughs> DNA strand, the translated protein becomes truncated and non-functional. <laughs> you can see that the tie boxer is now tied up, the soldier's gun is broken, and the drill is broken. Okay, so, so you get the point. The, the, the metabolites are important. When you, when you get rid of them, um, you no longer have an insect pathogen. And so that's actually one of the main things that I'm interested in my lab is um, trying to understand what some of these metabolites are from these fungi and what's their function. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention another, so these are related to the insect pathogens. They're actually pathogens of nematodes. And we have, I have a project in the lab where we are looking at fungi that parasitize the soybean cyst nematode. How many people have heard of the soybean cyst nematode? One, okay. WCCO farm report. There you go. So people who have farmed in Minnesota know about the soybean cyst nematode. It is in fact a pretty big pathogen of soybean and there aren't really very many good control me mechanisms. Um, and so what, what we're studying is we're trying to isolate some fungi that are parasites of the nematode that we might be able to apply to soil, apply to the plants and protect them from nematodes. Um, and these are also very cool fungi. They, um, there are some that are trap nematodes. So they actually have a little ring. And if a nematode swims through that ring, it'll constrict and trap them. Very, very, very cool. Um, others have these, they kind of set up fishing nets in the soil where if a nematode gets trapped in there, it will also be uh, trapped and eaten. So these fungi actually eat the nematodes. Nematodes are very good nitrogen sources um, and they, they eat them. And there are also structures called sticky knobs. They, if a nematode chip swims by, they can actually stick to one of these things. Um, and then also some that get into the worm and, and kill them and some that attack eggs. Um, so I have just one more little video of a poor nematode being trapped by a um, by the ring here. So this, this is the nemo, this is the nematode trapping structure, and here's a poor nematode that's gotten trapped. Anyway, he's not getting out. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I guess we will take any questions. And thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> Great.
Great. I see a hand up right over here. Okay. Actually, I'm dating myself. I think it was probably a Maynard Spies farm report back in the 50s. Okay. <laughs> but my question is, is any of this applicable to fighting pine borer beetle out in the Rockies? To, I'm sorry. In it, is any of this applicable to fighting things like pine borer beetle out in the Rockies? Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think we don't know enough about the fungal symbionts of the pine beetle yet. Um, but yes, I think maybe I should look into that, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually studying the emerald ash borer a little bit. Yeah. Trying to just understand what its microbial symbionts are. So... So I have a question for Kat. Yeah, come on up, Kat. <laughs> Kat, you, uh, you showed a, an orchid that you described as non-photosynthetic or almost non-photosynthetic. Mm -hmm. How does it produce anything? It must be a primary producer in order to give sugar, presumably, to its uh, fungal symbiont. So not um, all that up to speed on my botany skills, but I understand it lacks chlorophyll, but still has a few other pigments, and I guess it, give it, that, it will give it that red color. And, and so those pigments, I think, are helpful in undergoing a low level, low producing level of photosynthesis. So there's some, but perhaps you, you know well, more I about it, but there's not a whole lot, yeah. I think actually the plant may steal sugars from the fungus. It's sort of a reverse, reverse symbiosis. <laughs> not, not necessarily beneficial for the um, fungus. Somehow it's, it's gotten, the plant has evolved to get some of its sugars from the fungus, so it doesn't need to photosynthesize. Then the fungus needs a source of sugar. The fungus can make sugar. You know, it, it, degrades, it degrades these compounds, takes them up, and breaks them down into glucose, yeah. Is it mutualism? I don't know. But I don't know. <laughs> is white pine blister rust found in urban situations too or only in the greater pine forests? I mean, um, isolated pine trees in the city, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I've, I've, I've seen it in, in urban settings. So it's, it's something that seems to affect mostly, in fact, sorry, mostly younger trees and also um, trees that are all clustered together in a, in a timber uh, stand situation. But no, I have definitely seen it um, in an urban setting. And you may, if, if you're familiar with this pathogen, there's a complex life cycle that involves actually uh, fungal proliferation on, on a different plant, which would be the ribes plant. And um, in the 30s, is that right? I believe there was this, this huge ribes eradication program that they had in place um, to make sure that the fungus cannot proliferate anymore on, on that alternate host, we call it, on, on that plant. But so yes, it definitely did show up in the cities. Um, not, not so much as you would see it in, in, in like a, a timber stand. Have you seen it around? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So can you answer the big debate amongst mushroom collectors, whether they're ruining the, the mushrooms by collecting them, or as long as the mycorrhizae stay below the leaf litter level, collecting the fruiting structure is okay. I fight with my husband about this all the time, so if you can, if you can solve this one, I'd be much appreciated. Me or you? <laughs> you start. Okay, you, start. you want me to start. Okay. Um, my personal opinion, and I'll, I'll couch it as that, <laughs> is that it probably does, in, in mushrooms, it probably doesn't have a huge impact um, because mushrooms produce a lot of spores and they also can produce multiple mushrooms during the season. I mean, I think if you strip the land of all mushrooms, that would be a problem, but I think at the level, I mean, I think that's one reason why they have, you know, collection limits in some places in the United States, like in the Western U.S., they have, you have to have a permit. You can only collect so many mushrooms. Um, um, did I offer a comment on that? Okay. 
So I'm, I'm a friend of Catherine's. I'm, a, I'm not a scientist, but I'm a mushroom collector. I've collected and studied mushrooms since I was five years old. And I've been a commercial collector in upstate New York. And my experience has been, even the places that I, my favorite spots that I can get to like every day or every other day and pick really heavily, pick thoroughly, I cannot keep up with all the mushrooms that <laughs> good season. So if I have a patch of porcini that's flushing, they might go for a week to two weeks or so. And if I go every other day and pick every you know, half right to right mushroom, there's always some that get away from me. So yeah. I suspect that except uh, maybe different in Europe where there's hundreds of people out picking. But generally, it's very hard to pick all the mushrooms and, just, and create a situation where there's no spore production. And the mushrooms, the mycelium is still living underground continually, whether you're picking the mushrooms that are produced or not. Yeah, I think that's one... Well, actually, I just want to point out that's one major difference between mushrooms and the cordyceps fungus. So... The cordyceps fungus is m very much an obligate pathogen, so it doesn't survive well in soil. And so it really only lives inside its insect host. And so in that sense, it doesn't have the ability to survive outside the host, whereas mycelia are everywhere. They're living on tree roots. If you Probably the worst thing you could do would be to cut down all the trees. <laughs> that, would, that would have a huge effect, but I... Th I, there have been, there just haven't been that many studies on this, but there have been a few out in Oregon, actually. Um, but I don't think they've ever shown that it's had a huge impact. So, what's your what's your stance? <laughs> no, I I think you're right. I think you shouldn't pick all of them. Yeah, I support you. <laughs> Are there any concerns, like environmental uh, threats to fungi, um, like from chemicals in the environment or climate change? Um, I can think about a, a few things, maybe. Um, you know, growing up in Germany, growing up in Europe, and you may recall in 86, it was Chernobyl that blew up. and. Um, Ever since then, pretty much, the Germans stopped picking mushrooms <laughs> because, you know, mushrooms tend to take up environmental things, right? Whether those are heavy metals. In that case, it was nuclear fallout. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that is still the rule that's in place. It could be. I think it was more so after the nuclear fallout. But, but so as far as picking mushrooms, yeah, you know, it would keep an eye out where you're picking your your specimens. Um, let's let's see. What else did you ask? As as far as like climate change, have, you're thinking, or the fungus, if the fungus is endangered because of different environmental factors. I mean, I would say yes, <laughs> because well, I, I mean, there are. I think there's unfortunately the fungi kind of lag behind the the charismatic megafauna <laughs> in, in being represented as endangered species. And actually the cordyceps fungus, I think was the first fungus to be listed as an endangered species in the world. And now we have, now there are sort of efforts in a lot of different countries to do surveys and identify rare fungi. And we're finding that yes, in fact, some of them are being, are threatened. And I think to talk about climate change, the cordyceps fungus is a really good example because um, there's actually a, well, for one thing, their habitat is decreasing because they only can live, um, they also live at a very low temperature. They grow best at four degrees Celsius at very high mountaintops. And so as climate warms, it's actually moving, it's actually potentially going to get rid of their habitat if, if it warms to the top of these mountains. Um, and there are also parasites. There's, there's been found a parasite that is able to grow on the cordyceps and kill it um, that grows, that warming climate may be promoting. And so I think that, that yes, fungi are, are endangered in that sense. Um, 
And there may also be changes in the fungal community underground, like in the mycorrhizal communities, in the agricultural soil communities. We may, have, we may be seeing some shifts in what types of fungi are dominant in those communities. So I think it is, it is a big issue. So it seems like in um, most of the cases, the cordyceps is modifying the host behavior. Has anyone studied what it's actually doing to do that? And if you know they could like take those and throw them in mice or something and <laughs> manipulate the neurotransmitters of mice? Throw them in mice? Did you say? Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Just like how does how does that work? Is anyone studying? Yeah, no, what actually, that's doing? I mean, I'm interested in studying that. Um, I think it's a pretty interesting question. There's, there's actually a group of researchers at Penn State University that are stored, studying the zombie fungus, and they're trying to identify the actual compound that might be involved in changing. And so basically, that's called summit disease. So the, fun, it, the fungus causes it to climb to a very high place where once it makes a fruiting body, it can spread spores everywhere. And that's sort of its adaptive behavior. Um, but we don't know yet. We don't know what that what that is, but we hope to find out <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> so if we, sorry, think of mushrooms, I always thought the spore from a mushroom was an asexual, asexually created spore, but that is not true. It could be sexual or asexual. Two types, yeah. And no, then the, the mushroom spores are, are sexual spores, so they're, so I guess it, the way to think about it is that the mushroom is sort of the sexual fruiting body, and all the spores produced on it are produced through meiosis or sexually. But if you take a piece of the mushroom and try to grow it, that will, um, that will grow asexually. So are there asexual spores? In a mushroom. Yes. Or in anything. Well, yeah. Quididia, I guess. well, yeah. So yeah. in the in the asco the ascomycetes are mostly asexual. Mm -hmm. They grow as hyphae most of the time. Mm -hmm. Very rarely, actually, most of these insect pathogens are very difficult to find. They very rarely mate. Um, if you think about having to find an insect in the tropical forest and infect it to mate. It's actually a pretty rare phenomenon. So they dominant. They usually use asexual spores, but mushrooms tend not to have as many asexual spores. They produce more sexual spores. Great. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you at the next cafe in November. Thanks to Kat and Catherine for talking tonight. <laughs>